Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Will McBride. Let's get this going. And so we are pleased uh, that you can all join us for this lecture on our volume four of 12 week no neuropsychodactic series that brings uh, lectures from experts in the field covering different topics each week. This series was created by trainees and early career psychologists, uh, neuropsychologists to provide free, high quality uh, didactic opportunities. We would like to thank our sponsors uh, for their financial support for the series. Um, before we start here, are some disclaimers for the series. Uh, the training is not meant to uh, replace formal education in neuropsychology, uh, and the views of the speakers are their own. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A, um, Q&A box on the lower left of your screen, and a recording of today's lecture will be provided on the website uh, later this week. <clears throat> Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Jacobus John Donders uh, for the, today's lecture on neuropsychology report writing. Okay, Dr. Donders uh, is the chief psychologist at Mary Free Bed Rehabilitation Hospital in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He is board certified in clinical neuropsychology, pediatric clinical neuropsychology, and rehabilitation psychology through the American Board of Professional Neuropsychology. His main interests include validity of neuropsychological tests and prediction outcomes for after brain injury. In addition to being an active cloud clinical uh, practitioner, Dr. Donders has served on multiple editorial and executive boards, <clears throat> has published more than 100 publications in peer-reviewed journals, as well as several uh, edited and co-edited books, and is an associate editor, editor of Child Neuropsychology and Archives of Clinical Neuropsychology. He is a fellow of the American Psychological Association and the National Academy of Neuropsychology, um, and we thank him for his time today. Thank you. And I'm going to share my screen with all you guys. There we go. So um, we're going to talk today about neuropsychological report writing. And I'm going to see if I can forward my slides. It won't let me. Here we go. Of course, there are always objectives. We want to describe, by the end of this presentation, you should be able to describe the general guidelines for preparing for preparing evidence-based and practically useful neuropsychological reports. You should understand the specific applications in various settings, depending on where you work. And you should appreciate alternative service delivery uh, models and how to communicate with your consumers. Uh, a couple of disclosures. Uh, I have no external funding for this uh, talk. I do get royalties uh, from Guilford for a book that I wrote on report writing a couple of years ago. So having been honest, I'll move on to the meat of the matter. We all write reports in our own way and reports will differ according to a number of uh, factors. It could be the practice setting. Reports will probably be different if you work in a school versus an epilepsy surgery clinic versus in a prison setting. The purpose of the evaluation can have an impact on how you write your report. Is your report really only to give a diagnostic impression, or is it to help with treatment planning, or is it to help with eligibility for special education services? Your reports will probably look a little different. The target readership will differ. Um, if you write for attorneys, they like a lot of detail. They, they want to have as much information as possible. You write for a neurosurgeon, their attention span for our report is fairly short, so keep it short and sweet. Sometimes your reports will vary by consumer or payer requirements. I have certain insurance carriers who want certain phrases in the report, like I have to identify the psychometrist that I need, uh, that I used, I need to uh, document their certification, I need to keep track of all the minutes that I spend doing everything. That will have an impact on my report. Of course, your level of expertise will have an impact on how you write report. I write my reports different now than I did 30 years ago. And of course, their personal preferences. People like narratives, people like other people like bullet points, and all are acceptable as long as you get the message across in an effective manner. But a report can only be as good on the information on which it is based. Therefore, understand the referral question. What am I asked to do here? What, what, what are they asking me? How can I help them? 
understand what your role is. Is your role here to be an independent expert? Is your role here to be a treating doctor? Is it, is it your role here to give a second or a third opinion? What is your role? You want to be familiar with the condition of interest. Okay, now I've been in practice more than 30 years and I still occasionally run into conditions that I've never heard of before, if they're rare enough. But then I look up, look it up. If you only have training in pediatrics and you get referred an 80 year old with a question about dementia, you really should ask yourself, you know, should I be doing that? Or should I rely upon that? Should I get consultation? Always review all relevant records. And I always emphasize relevant. Um, in a pediatric evaluation, you want to get school records. If it's um, an elderly person, you want to get records from their primary care because they know what their, how their diabetes was managed and that the hypertension was managed and so forth. Always do a thorough interview in history. As neuropsychologists, we have a bad habit of just piling on and piling on the tests. And what I try to instill in my trainees is that if anything you don't want to skimp on, it's interview and history. You can answer a lot of the questions by just getting a good interview, a good history and good observations. And use appropriate and validated tests. Okay? Test, preferably tests that are validated for the condition at hand. For example, if you evaluate somebody with multiple sclerosis, you wanna take a look at some guidelines that were, have been developed in the literature for use with that population. Simple digit modality tests would be one of them that's highly recommended. When you get, when you're done, done your evaluation and you start writing your report, before you write or dictate a single sentence, you should understand its purpose and potential impact. And we're gonna put this in my report, how could it affect the reader, okay? Does it have a purpose? Does it inform? Does it tell the reader something they don't know yet? You should know before you even start writing your report exactly what main points you want to make and then how to support them. Don't start writing your reports and hope that wisdom start to come through you later spontaneously. It usually doesn't. Because otherwise, if you don't do this, you get verbal diarrhea. And I've seen plenty of reports that are just that. 10, 15, sometimes 20 pages go on and on, blabber, 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 and they really don't tell the reader anything new. And it all comes down to integration. In real estate, they say location, location, location. In neuropsych reports, it's about integration, integration, integration. You want to answer the referral question in the clearest and most evidence-based and succinct way. So it needs to be clear. It needs to be founded in fact, and it needs to be succinct. Why waste a lot of time and words if it's not necessary? And you should ask yourself, okay, now I've answered that referral question. Is there anything else that the reader should know? So the physician sends that person to me because they have a concern about, is this dementia or is this um, depression? And I'm fairly sure that it's depression, but during my interview, I also get, uh, information that strongly makes me suspect that this person has sleep apnea. Maybe they should get a sleep apnea test. What is the follow-up plan? So you've done your evaluation, you've come to your conclusion, you might even make recommendations. Is there a follow-up plan? Do you do a neuropsychological evaluation at certain intervals? Do you do it as needed? When would it be needed? I usually say if there's an eye-opening change in the patient's functioning. And your reports should be integrated so that they don't just regurgitate what was already in the medical record. You know, I've seen some summaries of neuropsychological reports that are a half a page long that just re repeat everything that was already sent to the neuropsychologist before they did a single test. That's not necessary. What can you offer that neurologist, that pediatrician, that surgeon, that teacher, that judge that is of incremental value, that tells them something they didn't know yet? And keep your recommendations realistic. I hate those reports that are followed by three or four pages of recommendations. They're all canned, they're the same for every patient. And there are simply so many of them that it's almost completely infeasible for them all to be implemented. I had a case recently, this was a pediatric patient, you know, two, three pages of recommendations. This child came from a rural area, low-income family, poor district, and they wanted. Uh, 
uh, with very limited internet access. And it was page and page of recommendations that I know that's never going to happen. Tie it to the patient and, and prioritize it. And what I like, in how you write your reports is what I call an inverted pyramid model. And you know, with a pyramid, you usually start from the bottom up and you work your way up. No, I like to say, okay, what is my top point? What is my top point that I want to make? What are the, what are the one, maybe one to three points that I really want to make? I want to make a diagnostic impression. I want to make a recommendation, whatever. After you've formulated for yourself, what one, two, three points you really want to make in your report, you really want to hit home, then you determine what will be the key aspects of the history, the observations, the psychometric data, the observations, whatever, that you would need to emphasize to support each of those three points. And after you've done that, then you can decide if there really anything else that should be in this report, because I've made my points, I've made my supporting pillars, is there really anything else that needs to be there? But to give you an example of how this works, um, a little bit more, all right. For example, for some reason, um, the, one of the blocks here came up. So my main point is that for this patient, this patient has dementia. It's not depression and the dementia is most likely of the Alzheimer type. That's my main conclusion. That's the main answer to the referral question. That's the top of the pyramid. I put it at the bottom because it's an inverted pyramid. Then I'm gonna add my pillars. Well, there's evidence that memory loss interferes with daily living. So this goes beyond mild cognitive impairment. This goes beyond subjective complaints. That memory loss, that person is forgetting to turn the stove off. That person is forgetting to take their medication. There's interference with activities of daily living. That makes a dementia. That's my support. In my test results on the California verbal learning test, I see a flat learning curve with rapid forgetting and there's no improvement under recognition format. That's the type of memory profile that you tend to see in dementia of the Alzheimer type. I've done some screeners of mood. PHQ is a three, CAT seven is a two. Those are well below the cutoff points. So I feel very comfortable saying, you know, it's probably not just depression. And there are no focal neurological signs. There's no REM sleep behavior disorders. There's no visual hallucinations. There's no urinary incontinence. I can probably rule out Louis body. I can rule out normal pressure hydrocephalus. That's another support for my main hypothesis or my main conclusion. So I made my main point first at the top of the pyramid, but I put it at the bottom here, I invert it. And I look, what do I really need to put in my report to support those points? And then everything else is really fluff, except for the recommendations that come after that. So possible hints for your trainees. When you go to, uh, to write your report or when you go to your supervision session, put all your documents in a logical order. So you don't sit there wading through it, you can't find it. No, it's always in the same order. It sounds anal retentive, it sounds OCD, and it is, but it helps. Okay? It, it's catch yourself organized. It's okay to make an outline or a diagram first. Look at that, that, that inverted pyramid that I just showed you. There's nothing wrong with you know, putting it out, putting it out on a paper first with a couple of lines in between the boxes. And sometimes it's helpful to think of what we would do to you if you were limited to a voicemail with a 100 second time limit. So you have to call a physician back with your conclusions and you got 100 seconds. What would you say? Or you have an email with a 100, 100 word space limit. I thought about uh, making this a tweet, but tweet is even shorter. So I'll give you an email of 100 words. Okay? You should be able to make your main point. Is this depression or is it Alzheimer's disease? And is there something else the reader should know within that time frame or within that space limit? Here's an example. So here's a woman who's in the hospital who wants to leave against medical advice. She's six or seven years old. She has a history of hypertension. She's widowed, lived by herself. She has 10 years of education. And she's in the hospital because of a stroke with right hemiparesis. She wants to go home, but her team members want her to stay or go to subacute rehab, which she's not willing to do. And they doubt her, her quote unquote competence. They think she's not 
with it enough to make that decision. So the physician orders a neuropsychological consult and wants a clear answer within 24 hours. So this is not one of the situations where you can sit on your report for three weeks. We shouldn't be doing that anyway. They want it within 24 hours. There's some urgency to this. So before I go see that woman, I have to ask myself some questions. What's my main role? Well, my main role is to say whether this woman is capable of making informed decisions about her medical care. Is she capable of doing that or is she not? My role is not to diagnose whether she has an expressive or receptive aphasia. My role is not to, to, to talk about if there's comorbid dyspraxia. My role is not to talk about blah, 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 blah. My role here is very specific. Can she make that decision to leave against medical device, advice or can she not? Once I answer that question, how do I get that information across in a way that the reader will understand? I got to keep in mind, I've got a team and a physician who want her to do something. She has a different opinion. Um, if I say, no, she's not capable, she's going to be unhappy with me. If I say she is capable, the team might be unhappy with me. Well, that's just tough. So how can I make it clear that they will actually accept that information? And what supportive information can I offer? without overwhelming the reader? It's a very simple question, very straightforward question. It should not require a 15 to 20 page report. And of course, again, what's the follow-up plan? Once you've given that information, then what do we do? So of course, I told you earlier, if there's anything you don't wanna skimp on, it's the interview and the history. So I interviewed this woman and she says, yeah, I know what they want, rehab home. I did that last year. My, um, and she points to her hip. She apparently had a hip replacement last year, but she can't think of the word hip. It was dirty. Beasts, no, not beasts, uh, uh, bugs, bugs. In uh, a lot of word finding difficulties, in the bathroom. I'm not going back there. And that, that comes out in one phrase, which is there's emotion behind it. I'm not going back there. So she's basically communicating, hey, I've been to that place, been there, done that. It was not clean. I'm not doing that again. I want to live, I can fall, I know, but at home, I want one of those, um, I fall and then I can't get up. And she mentioned that she's gonna wear around her neck, life call device. If blue clock don't pay, I will. This is a paraphasia, this is a blue cross. Do some tests. Um, Wasi, uh, not surprisingly, her vocabulary is lower than the major treason, but she has to talk. Um, her total learning on the, the California verb learning test is low. Her recognition is actually not all that bad. Same thing, delayed recall on the BVMT. Uh, visual learning is not great, but again, recognition is good. And then she knocks it out of the car for her age on the Wisconsin card, getting two categories, almost got the third one if she hadn't lost set. And her perseveration score is only a 40 or 44. That's reasonably good. On the NAV, of course, she has difficulty with naming the confrontation, not with visual discrimination. And despite her dysphagia, she is still able on judgment to reason about practical problems and medical decisions that you might have to make in daily life. And finally, with the old draw a clock one, this is her clock drawing. And keep in mind, she drew this with her left hand, which is non-dominant hand. So this is, for my opinion, not a bad clock. So if I had to write this report, I would say something like this. Mrs. Jones has mild deficits, about 1.5 standard deviation below the mean in her memory and language. However, interview as well as formal test results, such as NAB judgment, show intact pragmatic reasoning. She understands why her physician wants her to go to rehab, She's aware of the risk of falls, but she has no plans for deliberate self-harm. And for these reasons, I consider her to have sufficient mental capacity to make informed decisions about her medical care. I would like a visiting nurse to do some daily checks if she does go home soon. So I've answered the referral question, make it very clear. I've explained 
why I'm coming to that conclusion, and I have a follow-up plan. That note can go straight into the medical record. That's it. Technical aspects of report writing. I always recommend write short but complete sentences. And what I mean by that, sentences should not go on for four, five, six lines and get convoluted with parentheses and this and that. No, make it clear, make it short, but make them complete sentences or there's no loose ends hanging. Per paragraph, you want to present about one main idea with a few supporting sentences. So this paragraph is, okay, there's a selective deficit for visually presented information. And I can say that because the verbally presented information is fine and every visual memory test is bad. Okay, that's memory. Now we go to another subject. That's a different paragraph. You can use transition sentences to either change the topic or to highlight contrast. You can say, for example, you know, in the area of executive functioning, the findings were mixed. On the one hand, uh, this person did very well uh, when they could just talk about things like on their judgment. On the other hand, they did very poorly if they actually had to put something in, uh, in uh, to work and use feedback like on the Wisconsin cards to learn from their mistakes. They couldn't do that. Do not use passive voice. These tests uh, were considered and subsequently administered. No, we gave these tests. Use active phrasing. Works much better. Maintain the same tense. So don't jump back and forth between present tense, past tense, future tense. Stick to the need, stick to the same tensor and know the reader knows what you're talking about. Avoid jargon if you can, and if you have to use it, define it. So there's nothing wrong with saying that the patient was perseverative, but then clarify what that means. There's nothing wrong with saying the patient made a semantic paraphasia. Well, they used a related word that made sense. It was in the ballpark. It was not the word cell that you see in schizophrenia. Don't use ambiguous terms. Well, this was a bit better. There was a hint of impairment. Well, is it impaired or is it not? Don't use vague qualifiers or double negatives. It's not inconsistent with. What the hell does that mean? It's inconsistent with or it's consistent with. It's not, not inconsistent with. You can integrate sections from earlier parts in your report, but don't throw out teasers for later parts. Okay, so, oh, it's more to come. Yeah, you're not writing a novel. Cut down on unnecessary detail. Let me say that again. Cut down on unnecessary detail. Does it really need to be there for the purpose of this evaluation? And end your report with a bottom line or take home message that answers the referral question and gives indications for follow up. So, let's take some aspects of report writing and contrast different styles. Here's a developmental history in a pediatric patient. Here's one example. She was born at 6.8 pounds. Her APCA scores were 9 and 10. There was no neonatal jaundice. She had a few ear infections, but did not need tubes. She did not have febrile seizures. She showed transient stranger anxiety between 8 and 10 months. She started walking at 11 months and said her first sentence at 18 months. She was potty trained at 30 months, and she entered preschool at 42 months. Now, some of you might think this is a very nice developmental history. I call it the 98 pound weakling version of it. Why not just say this? The mother reported a completely uneventful pregnancy, birth and early development. Or the child's history prior to the accident in question was entirely unremarkable. That's a 300 pound gorilla response. That's the one I like. Here's another example of test results. First, the 98 pound weakling version. Performance on tests of expressive and receptive language was average. The test of visual receptive yielded low average findings, but the test of visual construction was high average. Performance on the verbal memory test was 90 scores points above that on the test of visual memory, but both were in the average range. It was perseverative on the WCST, a test of frontal integrity. And on the test of theory of mind, he was better, average. I can't tell you how many reports I've seen that read like that. You don't need to have a PhD or a PsyD to write a report like that. An undergrad can do that. 
I've actually done that. I've given that as a challenge to some of my undergrads to say, write a report that says which tests are average, not average, above average. They're usually in the high 90s correct. This is not interpretation. This is not integration. So let's do it differently. Let's go back to our 300 pound gorilla. Mr. Doe's test was normal in all cognitive domains with the notable exception that he was perseverative. That means, here's our jargon that I'm now going to explain, he continued to make the same error even when he was told repeatedly that he was doing it wrong. This suggests that he does not learn independently from his mistakes. He needs much more explicit redirection what to do instead. Okay, so now I've basically say, okay, away with all the fluff, all these all those average test results, they're normal, but this, this perseveration tendency stands out like a sore thumb. I'm going to define what it is, and I'm going to explain how it impacts in daily life and what to do about it. Of course, with every report, with every action that we take, there are ethical and professional issues. Your report should always document that you got informed consent and from children informed assent when possible. So basic APLA guideline, but I can't tell how many reports I've seen where that's not included. You wanna maintain a professional composure. This is particularly important if you also do some forensic work or if you just in, disagree with a prior provider, uh, don't make it something uh, polemic, uh, oh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He can't tell a cucumber from a frontal lobe. No, just say, well, I'm afraid I have to disagree with so-and-so because the data basically suggests that. Keep it professional. Minimize intrusions on privacy. Okay? Does certain detail have to be in there? The patient happens to be HIV positive, but his viral load is very low and all that. Do I really need to put in my neuropsychological report about their young adult ADHD that are HIV positive. Does it really matter? Or there's a complicating history of physical or sexual abuse. Can you just mention that there was trauma abuse without going into all the gory details? You know, I read a report a couple of months ago that went into gr great, I mean, agonizing detail about how this sexual abuse took place and with what methods and all that. I was aghast at no place in the report. You just say, okay, there's a history of personal trauma, still very much affecting the patient. I'm not going to discuss it in detail here. I will keep it in mind with the diagnostic conclusions or recommendations. It's okay to append the test summary uh, to your report. I routinely do. I list all the standardized scores, but you maintain test security in your report. You're not going to quote um, verbatim items from the WACE or the WISC or uh, pictures of the tests in there. And in your conclusions, you will only include what you can substantiate by your own data and the current state of the scientific knowledge. So don't go beyond the data and don't go beyond what the science really tells us. So, in, so far we've talked about clinical reports. Now we're gonna talk about forensic reports. In forensic reports, in medical legal reports, your role is there to assist the legal system, not the healthcare system. That system is by nature adversarial. And if you're not cut out for that, if you don't like confrontation, if you don't like hard questions, you probably shouldn't be doing this. The person that you're examining may not be your client. I see a fair number of people who are sent to me by an attorney on the opposite side of the lawsuit that the patient or the examinee has, fi has filed. At that time, that other attorney is my client, but the examinee is not my client. I still have to treat him with respect. Don't get me wrong. There's still ethical guidelines, but they're not my client. FERPA for school and HIPAA for healthcare typically do not apply. If people make their mental health part of a lawsuit, well, then you, you, a lot of confidentiality goes out the window. You typically have to provide a raw data with a few exceptions in most states. If there is a request to, to submit the raw data, you can ask them to, for them to be sent to another neuropsychologist because that's your preference. They, but if push comes to shove, you probably have to provide the raw data. 
and your work will be very closely scrutinized. So people will go over those raw data with a fine tooth comb, see if you made any scoring errors or whatever. In forensic reports, you typically have more records to review and discuss. I mean, I forensic is about 10, 12% of my practice. Um, it's not unusual for me to get an excess of a thousand pages to review, uh, which is much less than what I typically get for a clinical, much more than I get for a clinical case. Some of it I can skim through real quick, like chiropractic records were not relevant to me. Some I have to pay very close attention to. And then I have to make sure, make sure I reflect that I've actually taken a look at those records. It's crucial to document that you've informed the examinee. So this should be in your report that there's no treating doctor relationship, doctor patient relationship. There are limits on confidentiality. I say usually a doctor keeps between you and him or her um, what you tell them. The day you see me making notes, I need to write a letter, which go to attorney Jones. By law, anything that I send attorney Jones will have to they will have to share with your attorney. However, I cannot tell you anything about your test results, not because I don't like you, I didn't even know you, but that's the way these attorneys play their games and I cannot start you in any new treatment. So all of that should be in your report. Okay, that, and then you can say, are we okay to move on? That's informed consent at that point. You wanna write your report so that a person with an IQ of 90 should be able to understand it. And typically as neuropsychologists, we write for ourselves, right? We, we want other neuropsychologists or maybe a neurologist to read our report and you write at a high level. If this goes to court, if this goes to trial, the jury is just often a cross section of the general population. Um, you wanna have somebody with an average IQ be able to understand what you're saying there. And identifying impairment is not the same as answering the legal question. Here's an example. So the attorney says, uh, well, so, so what did you find? And the neuropsychologist says, well, he clearly has major frontal damage. The attorney says, yeah, but is he competent? Huh? And this neuropsychologist did not understand that just because you identify impairment, that does not address the legal question of competency. There are two kinds of forensic cases broadly. One is personal injury, one is criminal. Personal injury cases is typically a question about are there specific damages? Okay, is any harm being done to this individual? And are those damages causally related to the event or action in question, such as a car accident that occurred or a birth where the obstetrician purportedly made a mistake? And are there other contributing factors? Okay, okay there was a complicated birth. Uh, there was question about whether the obstetrician got there in time or not. Uh, this child, uh, four years later, does have some mental impairment. But we also need to keep in mind that both parents were in special ed, uh, didn't finish high school, uh, couldn't keep a job. Those were contributing factors. In criminal cases, the questions typically relate to what's called competency. For example, competence to stand trial, or diminished capacity, or insanity. And all of those things, competency, capacity, insanity, will be defined by local, state, or federal law. Not by us as psychologists, not by DSM-5. Okay, so if it says, what, what does it mean for a person to be insane? There will be law on the books in your state that say that this is what insanity means. This meets the criteria for lack of competency. You better familiarize yourself with those standards before you start doing this kind of work. So here's an example, a personal injury lawsuit after a motor vehicle accident. So this is a 32 year old uh, woman. She has an associate's degree and she has eight years of experience as an executive assistant to a vice president of a medium sized firm. She is nine months that has posed a traumatic brain injury uh, in a motor vehicle accident. She had a Glasgow Coma Skill score of 10, which put it in a moderate range. It was about the day afterwards that she didn't remember. And CT scan on the day of injury revealed bitemporal hemorrhagic contusions. This is a legitimate brain injury. Prior history of endometriosis, otherwise fairly unremarkable. 
and here are our test results. The medical simplicity test, she put forth good effort. Her predicted IQ is 104. Her full scale IQ is 99. That's within five points. That's with the error variance. However, look how low processing speed is. And on the rambles, her immediate recall of stories and design is good, but her delayed recall is not so good. Personality assessment inventory, no major elevations except for anxiety related disorders, which is subclinical still. So here's a report that I wouldn't like. The patient performed more than 1.5 standard deviation below the mean on a test of recall of only presented stories and 1.75 standard deviation below the mean on a test of recall of visually presented designs. Even though her IQ is normal, it appears that she does have brain dysfunction. Doesn't tell me much. I already knew she had brain damage. I saw the CT scan. It doesn't tell me anything. A more desirable version would be Mrs. Doe's memory and speed of performance, which the other guy forgot, are both worse than 90 to 95% of her peers. That puts it into context. A person with an IQ of 90 can understand that. And that's problematic in light of her job as an executive assistant. And it is more likely than not, this is standard in the medical legal field, that the moderate TBI caused a significant loss of ability. So now you put it in a language people can understand, you indicate why it's a problem, and you tie it to causality. Here's an example of a competency stand trial. 44-year-old man with an eighth grade education, long-standing history of schizoaffective disorder. He's been unemployed for a number of years and homeless. He had been prescribed Seroquel, but the compliance with medication is unknown. It's doubtful that he was regularly taking his medication. He's now accused, and this is a serious matter, of second degree murder of a young woman. Interview. So do you know what you've been accused of? They won't tell me, but I know. Never trust anybody. They just want my stuff. And I'm not going to tell them where my stuff is. You or anybody. They should talk to Andy. If you talk to Andy, and it sometimes gives me cigarettes. They say cigarettes are bad for you, but I don't know. Not. Can I help? Can you help your attorney, Mr. Jones, with anything about what happened that night? What night? I was not here last night. I was going to see Andy, but he was not there. Why do you keep me asking all these questions? I don't know. You think I'm stupid? Ask Andy. He will tell you I'm not stupid. I'm not smart. I ain't stupid either. You have any cigarettes? I'd like a cigarette. So it's very precious speech. Here are the test results, good effort. Borderline IQ, but consistent with pre morbid estimates. And unfortunately, the MRPI was not interpretable because of inconsistency. Less desirable report. Mr. Doe was angry and rambling during the interview. He invalidated the, the MRPI, so details about his personality are unclear. Nevertheless, although he has well below average intelligence, this does not meet the criteria for mental retardation, so he's competent to stand trial. No, that's not what competency to stand trial is about. Competency to stand trial is, do you, do you understand the charges? Do you understand how the legal system works? Do you understand what would happen to you if you were found guilty of those charges? So a more desirable interpretation here will be, Mr. Doe's IQ is indeed above the cutoff point for intellectual disability, but he clearly does not understand the nature and possible consequences of the charges against him. He's also too confused to assist his attorney in his own defense. Therefore, he lacks the mental capacity to stand trial. That answers the question. Finally, pediatric patients, we did an adult person before, an elderly woman who was going to leave and get medical advice. Uh, kids do stupid stuff, and that's how they get hurt. In pediatric reports, you often need to address the developmental history in greater detail than you would do with an octogenarian. You want to review school records when possible. You need to understand federal and state special education laws, what makes them eligible. And you want to strongly consider the family environment and take a long-term developmental perspective. Okay, If you get a kid who gets injured at the age of two, the full manifestations of those injuries to the frontal lobes may not become entirely manifest until adolescence. Doesn't mean it didn't have, I don't like the term grow into their deficits. Deficits were always there. We cannot always tap into them with our instruments at an early age. And when applicable, address transition issues. By transition issues, I mean, the kid who's 16 or 17 years of age who's about to turn 18 and you know is that person going to be capable of functioning as their own legal guardian here's an example an african-american boy seven years old with a stroke 
in the context of a history of sickle cell disease, multiple infractions on the MRI, some were silent. He had an early development that was normal until the age of five. He brought in my mom, who's a single parent on general assistance and Medicaid, so the resources are limited. He had to repeat kindergarten to do too many absences. And now the question is, is he resi for first grade? And does he need any support needs? Here are his test results. Okay, good effort on the time. Full skill IQ of 90, got some academic skills and some test uh, results of memory. I'll let you look at that for a second here. So here's our report from Dr. Short, but superficial. Giles' intellect is assessed by the WISC-5 and his academic abilities as assessed by the RAT-5 are within normal limits for his age. On the CVLTC, he has some problems remembering information, but he improves when provided with multiple choices. He appears cognitively ready for first grade as long as tests are multiple choice. What Dr. Superficial seems to focus on is the intact scores that are highlighted here. And of course, the poor score along the way free recall with the improvement on recognition format. But what he seems to miss, yes, the IQ is normal, but look at how low processing speed is. This cat is cramping in his hands because of the very uh, common sickle cell disease. He barely can hold a pencil. That's a problem for a kid at school. Also look at the proactive interference effect on CVLTC between the Monday list and the Tuesday list. So if we take that into account, then we can say Dr. Thorough, yet understandable, information that John learned before his stroke is well preserved. However, his memory is limited in capacity. That is, he simply cannot memorize as many details as most of his peers. And simply repeating the same information over and over again doesn't help him much. In addition, he's vulnerable to interference. Here's the jargon, I'm gonna explain it. That is, when two similar but competing sets of information are presented to him in rapid succession, he has moderate difficulty switching gears. Because of these findings, it's important to keep information as concise as possible and to avoid jumping from one thing to another. Finally, because of the cramping in his hands, he is slower than 95% of his peers when he has to use a pencil. All of these deficits are the result of John's strokes. They may seriously interfere with his academic success and therefore I recommend special education support under the OHI qualification, okay? There is a causal relation between the physiological event and the impairment, and it interferes with academic success. That makes them eligible. A few final things. Um, don't wait four weeks to get your report out. If you're missing reports uh, records, put in the caveat, hey, I'm, I requested these records, they're not here yet. You can use a secure email or phone call to give the fur and physician a bullet point down down. Nothing wrong with that. Don't send them on a wild goose chase with a long list of recommendations. And above all, answer the referral question. Educate them on what they don't know yet. There are other options to writing our traditional reports. I've had virtual conferences with the referring provider and the patient. We do it via a secure Zoom or Cinzi network. Uh, and we talk together. Talk, you know, should we put this person on the cholinesterase inhibitor, yes or no? You can use the patient portal uh, for a bullet point summary. In fact, I used a, uh, in, we use a medical record uh, called EPIC. It's called an after visit summary that you can prepare. I print that off and it's bullet points. Um, look, I've concluded that you have early Alzheimer's disease. I'm going to talk to your doctor about trying medication to help slow down any further decline. In the meantime, you need to improve your diet and you need to start exercising. Those are the main points. The patient walks out of the office with that. And I learned to do that because this happened to me when I brought my cat in for care. And I, they said, okay, this is nice. Got all that information. Why can't we do that? And it's not the right question. Why aren't we doing this? We can do this. If they're not internet savvy, if they can't use the portal, print it out. That's what I usually do with my elderly patients. Legal cases, all those medical legal cases, uh, virtual testimonies, now the norm. Uh, I do 
a fair amount of uh, capacity work for individuals with disabilities. I uh, testify in probate court typically once a week. It's all done virtually. I can do it from the same chair and sitting in there. Okay. Ten years ago, we wouldn't have thought about this. Okay. We didn't thought about video conferencing with a provider and the patient. We didn't thought about an after-visit summary that the patient actually walks out of the office with your main points in hand. We can do that. We should do that. Customers with tax critique will love you. Okay, they don't have the time and to pay uh, patients to read too much. So that is all I had. I'll be happy to answer questions at this point. Thank you, Dr. Donders. Um, I love talking about report writing and uh, the art of it is such a, a great thing. And um, this presentation was 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 incredible. Um, we do have a couple of questions and continue to please send in those questions if you do have them since we do have um, a good amount of time. Um, one of the first ones from someone in the, uh, in the chat, uh, what advice would you offer the trainees while working on developing efficiency, i.e. speed and report writing? I think it starts with knowing before you start writing what you're going to write down. What is my final conclusion? A lot of people get caught up, they start writing, and they hope that some divine wisdom will eventually come to them while they are writing. And it doesn't work that way. So I've got all these data, all these interviews. Go, let's go back. Why is this person here? What question am I being asked? Can I answer that question? And I'm not going to write anything until I can answer that question. Okay. I now know what the answer to my question is. Okay, how, how can I be so sure? What really needs to be in my report to support that? And if you do that, if you, do it, you use that in the inverted pyramid model, you say, okay, do I really need to talk about the color of the, the blouse that she was wearing? Do I really need to talk about the favorite food? Do I really need to talk about these lab values that have absolutely, absolutely nothing to do with the, the, the question I'm being to this? Okay, his aluminum is what, blah, 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 blah but his aluminum is not relevant. Now, if it's a B12 in an alcoholic, that's a different story, okay? If it's a person with depression, you wanna know about the TSHs because you've already about hypothyroidism, that's a different story. But focus on what's really relevant. So make sure that before you start writing anything, you know what is eventually going to be your bottom line message, how you support it, and everything else you can probably leave out or spend as little uh, time on as possible. That example of the developmental history I gave, if it's completely unremarkable, why do you have to go through every single app car score or developmental milestone? Just say it's unremarkable. Save yourself some time, save the reader some time. But it all starts with knowing what the bottom line, the final message is, and then narrow it down. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in a follow up to that, um, in my, my training experience and other people I've talked to, Supervisors have them start very expansive in terms of that developmental history, detailing all of those components. Mm -hmm. And then as they get better at doing that, they move into being more concise. Are you suggesting that that might not even be necessary or do, how do you view that approach? I do not believe that is necessary. Um, I am a firm believer of one day shopping. That means the patient comes in, they have their interview the same day, they have their testing the same day, they have their feedback the same day. Okay? They, I know places who do it differently. I know places you come in one day for your interview, then you come back another day to get your testing done, you come back a third day to get your results. I think that's bad customer service. I have patients who come from an hour and a half away. I have patients who are on Medicaid, on a, on a fixed income. Uh, I don't think that's the right thing to do. Now, why should we start with a bad model that is inefficient, that doesn't serve anybody because those, those lengthy 15, 20 page reports, who do you think reads those other than your supervisor? Or maybe another psychologist. Do you think a neurosurgeon is gonna read that? Why start with a bad model then we're gonna eventually go to a good model? No. Start with a good model right away. So, you know, my resident, my I don't have an internship, I have a postdoctoral residency program. Yeah, they they get thrown in the deep water right away. 
they give feedback the same day and they need to get their report done. If they have nurse psych evals on, let's say on Mondays and Thursdays, they better have that report on that Monday patient done before the Thursday patient comes along. Okay. Make it concise, make it concise, uh, uh, make it specific, make it useful. Okay. I see no point in starting with a model that you're eventually going to abandon and that really doesn't serve anybody. Start with the right approach first. Uh, another question we have in the, in the chat, uh, what is the typical length of your reports? In a clinical case, it's usually two, mostly at most three pages, plus an addendum with the test, uh, test results. In a forensic case, it might be one or two pages more, but even because I have a lot more records to review, sometimes the referral comes with 10 or 12 specific questions that I need to answer in, a, in an itemized manner. But most of my reports are two or three pages long. Okay. And, and to tie into that, uh, there's a question about including test results and reports. Uh, some trainers or some supervisors don't do that because patients see those scores and they get confused or try to decipher them. Um, are you saying that you're comfortable with having those test results uh, scores in there? Yes, I always have a, uh, I've been doing this for, about 30 some years now. I mean, I've always had a disclaimer in there. And so I have a, 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 a header on the test uh, score section that basically says, okay, SS means standard score. The mean is 100, standard deviations is 15. Scores below, uh, standard scores below 80 are below the 10th percentile. That's where we raise an eyebrow. Uh, here's a T score, and that's a mean of 50, a standard deviation 10. And any of these scores should never be interpreted without consideration of the associated narrative report. So I put that all in there. Okay? That's my attempt at making sure that people don't misinterpret. However, I also need to keep in mind, those data are the patients. They're not mine. Mm -hmm. They have the right to that information. And personally, I hate nothing less than getting a report from another psychologist but there's vague references to, well, this was an average, this is above average, and I don't have any numbers. And I can't compare their findings to my findings. So in terms for, particularly for continuity of care, I think it's advisable to have some scores in there. Now, you gotta be careful what you put in there. If, for example, you have performance validity test results, I wouldn't say, okay, the standard for passing the TOM is 45 out of 15. This person got only 41 out of 15, blah, blah, blah. No, you just put the 41 there. And you can say in your report, the patient violated empirically established cross-validated performance validity criteria. Okay, but this, the, the, the data, in my opinion, should be there. Okay, great. Are you, uh, how do you feel about uh, dictating reports? Is that something that you do or that you, you know, is that something that you recommend for people? Um, yeah, I dictate all my reports um, and we have a voice to dictation system. So there's no person transcribing it for me. Um, it is something you have to get used to. The, the, the computer has to get used to your voice, in my case, to my accent. Um, but it goes very quickly. And so I can see as I'm speaking, it, it's typing it out for me. I can correct errors right away. Um, and it's almost more like having a conversation. Um, so yeah. If you're early in your career, you want to type first. I mean, I, I can understand it might be difficult as you get more. I strongly recommend my res residents that by the by their second year, they should be dictating. Saves a lot of time. Initially, initially when you start dictating as opposed to writing, it's going to take you a little longer. It's a learning process. But in the long run, it's going to save you so much time. Great, great. Um, one of the other questions we have is, uh, should we provide a version of the report, same length or shorter in the person's most proficient language? Okay, so if you're, you're talking about a bilingual person? Uh, I, I believe so. Um, not sure if they ex could expand any more on that question, but um, okay. yeah. Yeah, so if, let's say I have, uh, was a situation recently where I elected to evaluate a person in a language that was not English. And I did that with a professional independent interpreter because I could not find a neuropsychologist within a day's driving 
who spoke that language. So you, if, if, it was a, if it was somebody Spanish, I would know exactly what it's in them. Okay, but in this case, th this was a different language and uh, I used an interpreter. So um, I, of course, I'm not gonna write my report in Turkish or Moroccan or whatever, I forget what it was. Um, but I did have it, um, basically my, that summary section that I just quote, you had this woman has dementia, it's most likely the Alzheimer type, and when you try and call an esterase inhibitor, that I did have translated and by the interpreter make sure it was back translated. Yeah. But so, so for it to go into the patient portal, uh, that, that's, yeah, that's why I would put it translated version. Okay. I wouldn't um, translate my entire report. Uh, that's not that's not feasible. Gotcha. Um, here's a two part question. Um, I, I keep a line, running list of recommendations that I use to refer to reports. And do you have any recommendations on uh, uh, writing the recommendation section? And then also, should I keep a running list of phrases and explanations how you have um, that I could pull from to make the writing process more proficient or more efficient? Um, I will answer the last question first. No, don't, I, I would, I recommend against a running list of phrases uh, because that becomes a cut and paste version. And that's usually not a good thing. Now, do I sometimes use the same phrase in different reports? Yes, but I'm not having a drop down menu of the patient was cooperative, not cooperative. Right? I mean, Keep it simple, keep it straightforward. Um, in terms of writing recommendations, recommendations, first of all, should make sense considering the data that you have. If you've done an evaluation and you have a child of normal intelligence who's performing with, well within normal limits, all tests of academic achievement, including reading comprehension and flu, uh, math fluency and so forth, there should not be a recommendation for a learning disability specialist. That's not grounded in the data. Make sure your recommendations are evidence-based. Well, I am going to um, recommend uh, hyperbaric oxygen treatment to improve the outcome of this person with mild traumatic brain injury. Well, there's actually several large randomized control studies that have shown that hyperbaric oxygen treatment doesn't do anything for mild traumatic brain injury. So don't put that in there. And then third, make sure the recommendations are not only supported by the data and the science, but are tied to this particular individual. So you don't make the same recommendation for everybody and make sure they're feasible. A very simple example, a case recently where an, a young adolescent with a frontal lobe injury um, had some um, pragmatic skills, uh, uh, a right frontal lobe injury, uh, very poor judgment of social situations, didn't read them well, poor theory of mind. And the, the, in, in the report that I was reviewing, the recommendation was, well, the best way to treat this is to take this person out into the community, have somebody wear a body cam, uh, video record their interactions, and then review those interactions afterwards with them so they can see what they did and then give them uh, pointers on what they can do instead. Sounded great, except this person was Amish. The Amish do not like to be video recorded. They will actually refuse to be video recorded. So it made sense for a lot of people. It did not make sense for this patient, okay? So make sure your recommendations are evidence-based, they fit the data, and they fit the patient. Okay. Um, I wanna be respectful of the time, uh, Dr. Donders. Um, do, do you have a few more minutes to continue answer questions? Uh, sure. All right. Um, I great. Uh, how would you write about non-standard administration? For example, the examiner did not prompt the client to give three responses on visual puzzles, thus causing the client to miss this discontinuation criteria superficially um, early. What would you still include the test results? And if so, would you report the VSI? Um, I would probably say, hey, we screwed up. Um, we made a mistake and that test is not valid. Now, if I deliberately changed administration for some valid reason, I would say I did it for that reason. Uh, for example, I have this young man who is uh, 17 months and 11 months uh, of age, uh, 17 years, 11 months of age. The question is about 
mental capacity, I actually score this test as if you are already 18 years of age, because that is going to be the standard which you become prepared for when, you, when the question of legal majority comes up. Or, um, you know, uh, we were doing the Wisconsin card sorting because the patient was getting increasingly agitated. So uh, he finally got a, a category towards cards number uh, 61 or 62. Normally, I would have basically said, okay, wrong, because if the next time he says color or form, whatever it was. In this case, I just didn't do that because I didn't want to alienate the patient. Okay. If there is a legitimate reason for it. But if you screwed up, just say so. I mean, we all make mistakes. As long as we catch them, we try to um, remediate them. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, the, the last question we have that we'll, that we'll take for right now, um, how do trainees navigate the reporting style of their supervisors in consideration of the brevity and concise approach you may take? Well, talk to your supervisor. I mean, I, and it's, you know, some people are more flexible than others. Uh, and, you know, uh, I, I allow my uh, residents a certain grind of uh, latitude because they have been taught by their former supervisors certain things. Um, they have certain phrases they like or they have certain ways of organizing the reports like. What I hammer them on is, is this all this detail really necessary? And this, this what I call laundry listing, this test was average. That was, this was below average. And that doesn't help. So as long as they get to the point as long as they can formulate the answer to referral question in a succinct manner and support that by relevant information, I'm fine with it. Uh, what I'm not fine with is just regurgitating what was in the medical record, just describing test results without integrating them or opening up the same can of recommendations regardless of the situation of the patient. So I, I think the best thing is talk to your supervisor. You know, what, what, how is it helpful for me to write these lengthy reports. Okay, if we can talk about them in supervision. In supervision, I wanna know that you actually to discuss the developmental history, like the APCA scores and developmental milestones. Do you know when kids are supposed to put words together in sentences? Do you know when to start to walk? What's the time frame? blah, blah, blah. But we don't, does that necessarily mean all has to be in the report? Okay. So I would say pay more attention to the supervision process as opposed to loading that all in the report, because that report is not there for training purposes. That report is there for communicating with the referral provider. Thank you so much, Dr. Donders. Um, uh, this was just such a great presentation uh, to end off this round. Um, we, we greatly appreciate your time. Um, just want to let everyone know a recording of the lecture will be disseminated via email again in the next few days and will be available on the neuropsychology website. Um, for those, so, so we will be posting that presentation um, on there as well. Um, greatly appreciate your time. I'm happy to have you here. Um, and, and we look forward to, to, to you coming back maybe another time. All right. Have a good day, folks. All righty.